Cast your mind back to just over a decade ago when Curiosity landed on Mars. When the Minecraft craze started. And Atlantis began the final mission of America's 30-year shuttle program. 2011, the year MIT envisioned a brilliant future. And ways to tackle some of the world's biggest challenges. A vision that became the MIT campaign for a better world. Because we are passionate about solving problems, we ask the question, what does a better world look like? Would it be a place where everyone has access to clean drinking water? Or where prosthetic limbs emulate the function of natural limbs? Would it be a place where Alzheimer is cured? Where we have unlimited sources of power? Would it be a place where the air we breathe is cleaner? Or where learning is open to everyone in the world? All that and much, much more. So we embarked on one of the most ambitious campaigns in higher education. In 2016, we announced our campaign to the world. We built buildings and constructed labs. And we researched, we educated, and we innovated. We wrestled with climate change to better understand and predict patterns of extreme weather. We improved patient care by integrating neuroscience and anesthesiology. We applied theories of finance and the marketplace to improve how healthcare is delivered. We shaped public policy to alleviate poverty. We manipulated matter in new and exciting ways in targeting drug delivery for cancer and nanoscale assembly of synthetic biomaterials. We made music in startling new ways and developed new technologies to vary thermal conductivity on demand, get more heat out of sunlight, and make buildings more energy efficient. We worked, we collaborated, and we unleashed our creativity as we imagined what a better world would look like. And then, in 2020, a global pandemic reminded us just how important our journey was. As COVID spread across the globe, MIT did what MIT always does. Rolled up our sleeves and met the challenge. We innovated, sending supplies to local hospitals. We educated, pivoting to and supporting remote learning. And we leveraged a key element that lies at the heart of research at MIT. Time. mRNA technology developed at MIT over decades, was able to be deployed quickly and effectively to create a life-saving vaccine. Because at MIT, there is no such thing as a challenge too great, too daunting that together we cannot solve. A better world is all that we can imagine. Brought to life by the minds and hands of MIT working in concert. It's what we have done, what we are doing, and what the future will bring and it's all fueled by the generosity of MIT's global community of alumni and friends. Our pursuit to make a better world continues. Please welcome MIT President Raphael Reif. What a great video, at least I humbly think it is. Uh, shows uh, such a magnificent showcase of MIT talent. And we're just getting started. Welcome to MIT Better World Weekend. I'm delighted to see all of you here on campus. This special weekend is for you, and it's also about you, your impact, your vision, and what you have made possible for MIT and for the world. Among the more than 112,000 people from around the globe who supported the campaign, there are three individuals whose commitment to MIT deserves special recognition. 
I'm referring to John Reed, Bob Millard, and Diane Green, who each served as chair of the MIT Corporation during the campaign. John played an instrumental role in planning for the early stages of the campaign and during its silent phase. John and his wife, Cindy, served as the campaign's honorary chairs. Bob was of immense help during the campaign public phase. He traveled extensively to meet with alumni and friends, and Bob and his wife, Bethany, graciously opened their home to host a range of campaign events. Diane saw us through the final year of the campaign, encouraging MIT Corporation members to achieve a phenomenal participation rate. So on behalf of MIT, I offer my deepest gratitude to John and Cindy, Bob and Bethany, Diane and her husband, Mendel, for the leadership and dedication to the Institute. Please join me. When we launched the campaign, we started with the premise that to make a better world, we needed to make an even better MIT. We all know that the Institute is a magnet for the world's finest talent. But to continue to attract the best, we have to continue to make the magnet stronger. To support the faculty and students who are drawn to MIT, we need to ensure that they have the resources they need to push boundaries and seek new solutions, like scholarships and fellowships that enable students to follow their passions and reach their potential, like professorships that give faculty the freedom to focus on what they do best, and the tools and the spaces that allow them to explore their boldest ideas and expand the frontiers of knowledge. Your commitment to the Campaign for a Better World has given MIT the ability to attract talented people from everywhere, to welcome them into spaces designed to enrich their lives and their work, and to support research and discovery, innovative teaching, and hands-on learning. You enable us to encourage more building, making, practicing, performing, and every once in a while, not too often, relaxing and recharging. And even when our community was scattered around the globe, striving to achieve their goals in an endless variety of spaces and places, you helped us stay connected, creative, and motivated. Please take some time this weekend to walk around and explore the campus. You will experience an MIT that is humming with potential. And this is your generosity in action. Your commitment to the campaign has made MIT stronger at its core so that we can make a meaningful impact on complex challenges like climate, economic inequality, and human health. We have made great progress already, but as all of you know, our pursuit of both solutions never ends. You're about to meet a few of the MIT faculty who are deeply engaged in this pursuit. Each of one, each of them, is making groundbreaking advances in their field, such as transforming the way we think about and diagnose breast cancer, such as developing fusion energy, the single most promising move we could make to decarbonize our planet, and such as leading MIT into a new era of cross-institute focus on the power of design. Eric Grimson, Chancellor for Academic Advancement, and Julie Lucas, Vice President for Resource Development, will introduce you to these remarkable people who embody our community's desire to do good for humanity. They will leave you inspired about the future and about all that we can accomplish together. I thank you so very much for joining us this afternoon. And now, Eric and Julie, thank you.
As you know, we won't have many more opportunities to hear from Raphael in a setting like this with friends and alumni. So we're particularly delighted to have him here today. Please join me again in thanking Raphael. The MIT Campaign for a Better World was set in motion 10 years ago, propelled by a vision no less ambitious than tackling the world's biggest challenges. To accomplish that work, we needed new spaces for making, experimentation, and creation, new labs for research, and places to vitalize multidisciplinary collaboration. Over the course of the campaign, six new buildings have been added, 13 buildings have been renovated and renewed, and a dynamic outdoor space was created. With another four new or existing buildings under construction and two more in design, all of which will help MIT for the next century and beyond. This is the place where the minds of MIT can tackle the challenges of the future. Challenges that will be met in part by funding for research, funding to support faculty, to provide for fellowships and scholarships, all in the service of advancing science and technology, of expanding our understanding of the universe, of humanity, and our relationship to one another and the planet, and of delivering knowledge and understanding to individuals around the world. The achievements of the campaign have been made possible by everyone in this room and thousands upon thousands of individuals who couldn't be here this weekend. But for those of you who could be here, I hope that today has given you a taste of the breadth and depth of the work the campaign has enabled. Now, we want to present a few more extraordinary people and projects that exemplify all that the MIT Campaign for a Better World has made possible. Please welcome the professors who are leading the new MIT Morningside Academy for Design, Director John Oxendorf and Associate Director Maria Yang. Many people know MIT as a world leader in technology. And of course, that's so necessary for making a better world. But what people outside MIT may not realize is our breadth and our depth in design expertise. Design is how we deploy technology in society. To make truly socially impactful change, we must design things in a way that really takes advantage and deeply considers the human side of the equation. So in recent years, we created both a design minor and a design major for students in any department to engage with design as a discipline. And the design minors quickly become one of the most popular minors across MIT. One example of the way MIT students have made an impact through design is in Moving Health, which is a startup company co-founded by Emily Young in the center. She's an alum of the mechanical engineering department. And a few years ago, the country of Tanzania made it possible to get free medical care for women who were giving birth in a hospital setting. The challenge was in, for rural women who did not have access to travel. So what Emily and her co-founders at MIT D-Lab and her local partners did is they designed and fabricated and manufactured a whole new low-cost ambulance to help women get to where they could get the care they need. And now their company has sort of crossed all of Africa. Another example I'd like to share with you is Bloomer Tech, which was started by alumni of the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science and the Integrated Design and Management Program. And what Bloomer Tech realized is something I did not know, which is that cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of women. But the way cardiovascular disease presents itself in women is different than in men. So what they did is they came up with a smart wearable bra embedded with wearable sensors to help track potential symptoms of cardiovascular disease, to bridge its gap. And the final example I'll share with you is this. So you might have heard of BioBot, which was started by an alum of the Urban Planning Department and the Department of Biology. And what these two co-founders realized is that it's important to design systems in a way that makes data real so that humans can act upon it. 
So now their system for detecting the prevalence of COVID in wastewater has been adopted by the state of Massachusetts and is used in municipalities across the US. So it's in this context that a few years ago, Dean Hashem Sarkis of the School of Architecture and Planning and Dean Anantha Chandrakasan of the School of Engineering asked John and myself to work with a group of faculty just focused on design across MIT's all five schools and our College of Computing. And what our committee found was that first, design lives all across MIT, wherever you can imagine. And the second is our signature at MIT in design is that it's interdisciplinary. So it's design plus computing, or design plus management, or design plus health. And of course, along the way, we found, a, we created a big wish list of things that we really want for design at MIT. And one of the, the key aspects of how we're gonna elevate design across MIT is to create a new hub. So the Metropolitan Warehouse in the heart of our campus this summer will be reinvented as a new home for the School of Architecture and Planning, but also as an amazing new hub for design across the entire campus. So imagine studios for designing across disciplines, uh, maker space on the ground floor, the newest, one of the largest maker spaces on any campus in the world, where students can come do hands-on innovation and in, in creating a reality from their designs and gathering spaces for public programming and events, exhibitions. So this is a space where you could imagine a computer science student, a civil engineering student, an architect, and maybe a Sloan student working together to design a whole new way to address climate change in cities. Or imagine a school bus full of kids, middle school kids, who come and visit the Met Warehouse they see a gallery of new designs created by MIT students, but then they get to do design activities or a workshop run by current MIT students. And many of you have been engaged in helping to support this incredible project, and of course it's going to impact the lives of our community, but it's gonna truly help to make a better world for people all over. And while this building will be a vital new hub for design, we're also supporting students and faculty who are leading the way in design. So we're announcing new graduate fellowships in design open to anyone across the schools. A new first year learning community for undergraduates interested in design, as well as research funds to support faculty and new projects that are geared toward design and climate solutions. And one of the things we're most excited about are outreach programs for K-12 activities in design to inspire future generations of students who of course are leaders in science and technology and the arts, but allow them to use design uh, to deploy those ideas. And we've endowed many of these activities for perpetuity thanks to a transformational $100 million gift for design at MIT that we announced this spring. And this comes from the T.H. Chan family's uh, philanthropic arm, the Morningside Foundation, who've created the MIT Morningside Academy for Design to achieve all of these ambitious goals and more. We're gonna create bold thinkers who can tackle societal problems across disciplines. We're gonna put human-centered approaches to design throughout an MIT education. And by supporting students and faculty financially, our students can take risks and can be more entrepreneurial to scale this impact globally. And in this way, we hope to really plant a flag for design at MIT and around the world. The Academy for Design uh, will be a catalyst for design all across MIT. It will help us educate a whole new breed of designer who's interdisciplinary and socially impactful, and it will really enable socially impactful change. And we believe that's how you make a better world. Thank you. This new academy builds on MIT's extraordinary leadership in design-focused education to become a global hub for design, research, thinking, and entrepreneurship, integrating design across the institute and beyond. Now, for a look into another exceptional endeavor, I'm pleased to introduce the School of Engineering Distinguished Professor for AI, who serves as the AI faculty lead in the Jamil Clinic. Regina Barzilay. So, hello.
Hello. The one thing that I want to say, I'm not going to have such a beautiful graphics as my previous presenter because I'm not part of the School of Design. Uh, but I'm going to talk about something which is really important to many of us, which is disease diagnosis. We know that each one of us are going to be sick with some disease in our lifetime. And we also know that today we can treat diseases much better when we are in early stages, when we can diagnose the diseases as early as possible. And when we saw our first video about the campaign for Better World, which started in 2011, I immediately thought that three years after the campaign started, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And what I discovered at the time, that my cancer was missed by two years, Later, when I started doing the research on this topic, I also discovered that apparently 30% of women who go and do their breast mammogram, they are told that they are fine, they're actually not fine. So I was not a unique case. And this particular experience motivated me to try to change it. So think about how diagnosis is done today. So those are mammograms, uh, and when you know, radiologists look at them, they try to identify cancer. And it's really hard, and cancer should be big enough that our eye can actually detect it. So imagine to yourself that you can look at one of these images, which seems to be perfectly fine, there is nothing, and machine can tell you that this particular patient is going to develop breast cancer in three years. You, there are treatments that you can give, you can screen them dif differently, there are lots and lots of things that you can do. But if we are just relying on humans, humans cannot detect it because the pattern is not clear. So with that, we actually started our quest of developing machine learning techniques that can look at the image, which seems to be benign, which means that the patient will be sent home as healthy patient, and try to predict which one of them are going to develop cancer. I'm showing you examples on breast cancer, but now we've developed technology for lung cancer, and we are making big advancement in prostate cancer and um, pancreatic cancer. But let's just look at the graphics in breast. So how the machine can do it? You know, it sounds like kind of miracle. But if you think about it, what we know about biology, cancer actually takes quite some time to develop and grow. And uh, the idea is that if we are looking at the images of women for whom we know the outcome into up to five years, the machine can correlate these very subtle patterns that human eye cannot identify with a particular outcome. And that's what exactly we did by teaching the machine to take a very large collection of hundreds of thousands of mammograms with known outcomes and to train it to see the correlation. And uh, this particular model, let's see if you can see a video. Yeah. So this model is implemented today in multiple hospitals. I will show you the world map with it. But maybe our first place where we started this work was Massachusetts General Hospital, where I happen to be treated and which is just right across the road. And what you've seen in the video is a radiologist that actually using this technology. And I want to say that it had a very interesting uh, utilization during COVID time, because during COVID time uh, in MGH, as in many other hospitals around the world, the screening was stopped. So you couldn't go to the clinic, and as a result, we already see there are a lot, a lot of people who should have been diagnosed early were delayed. So for those who actually go to Massachusetts General Hospital, we have a model that look at the previous mammograms of the patient and identify who are those women who need to be prioritized and brought into the clinic despite very limited uh, screening. So, uh, and uh, this uh, shown to be very, very uh, useful in identifying such patients. Now, I want to say, because we're talking about better world, the world is not only MIT and Cambridge community, it's really bringing this technology to the world at large. We also know that there are a lot of concerns today in the general population where the AI that we develop only works for you know, people here and may not scale up to other countries. So what you see in the dark red is the places where we actually took these models and implemented them. You can see that we um, did it in multiple hospitals in the United States, uh, looking at a very diverse population in places like Emory and uh, Navant, which is located in uh, Carolinas. 
but we also went to other places. We went to Brazil, we went to Israel, to Taiwan, to Sweden. And the reason I put the pictures here of uh, the student, Adam Yala, who did this fantastic job, was because it's medical data. So we actually had to travel there just when the pandemic started to do the testing. And those are the slight uh, red places where we are currently doing implementation. And with the help of uh, Jamil Clinic, uh, and we're extremely grateful uh, for support from Mr. Jamil and his family, and Welcome Trust, we are creating a network of hospitals where all this great AI technology that is developed at MIT in the space of healthcare will be distributed around the world. And I'm particularly happy to say that we are looking at the places like Nigeria and others which don't have access to the same technologies that we are developing here. But when we were deploying this technology, you know, one thing that came to my mind is it's great because we need to have mammogram, we need to have imaging for lung, for breast, for other organs. And then I realized that maybe we can actually, looking forward, try to change the way we are doing it. And right now, I'm working with a colleagues from Koch Institute, which is just here somewhere, um, with uh, Tyler Jacks, on designing a very specific test, blood test, which can look at your immune system status and predict, based on your T-cell behaviors, what type of cancer is likely to happen. And the hope is that not only this test is going to be very cheap because it's a blood test, you can do it around the world, but also it's going to be very early. We don't need to see something on the image. Maybe we can do it when you are just starting to get the disease and then we can act upon it. So this is something that hopefully we can bring to the world and make it a better place for the patients and their families. So thank you very much. The use of AI to analyze massive amounts of data and make predictions about what conditions may likely appear enables doctors to not just diagnose, but to proactively treat disease. This work is a giant step forward in improving the future of human health. Now, we have one more professor who will share his vision for the future of energy. Please welcome the director of the MIT Plasma, Fusion, Plasma Science and Fusion Center and a fellow native of small town Saskatchewan, Dennis White. Yeah, go Rough Riders. Uh, <laughs> Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so, life on Earth, uh, in fact, you, is made possible by fusion, if you, if, even if you didn't know it. So, the fusing of hydrogen, which happens in the center of stars, including our own sun, releases staggering amounts of power because it changes the hydrogen into helium, it rearranging the nuclei, meaning that the energy that's released per reaction is 20 million times any chemical reaction. So since we understood how stars work, it has been a dream to bring this energy source to bear on Earth. Now in the face of climate change and energy uncertainty, this is more urgent than ever. So what stops us? Why is this so difficult? Well, one of the reasons that it's difficult is you have to recreate the very high temperatures over tens of millions of degrees that occur in the center of the sun. We actually have done this already, replacing the gravitational force that contains fusion in a star, but instead using powerful magnetic fields. This sounds like science fiction, but we did it here on the MIT campus using the Alcator devices. They achieved temperatures five times hotter than the center of the sun, 100 million degrees. But the technology to produce the magnetic fields is either too expensive with, with respect to power productions. For example, the ones in Alcator here on the campus would consume several hundred million watts of electrical power. Ah, so great science experiment, not an obvious energy source. Or the, the ones that would be produced with superconducting magnets would, be, would produce such a weak magnetic field that it would greatly increase the size and cost of the fusion device. So this was standing in front of us, and we needed a revolution in electromagnet technology. 
And in 2021, September, a very long Labor Day weekend, we did it. This is a photo of the model electromagnet constructed and tested at MIT. It matched the powerful magnetic fields which were used in the Alcator experiments. Over 20 Tesla, to put this in context, this is 400,000 times the Earth's magnetic field. Yet it only consumed 25 watts of power when it was operating. Um, an extraordinary accomplishment by our amazing team. This was a revolution in many ways. We reinvented superconducting magnets conceptually. So for example, it is highly modularized, greatly simplifying the assembly and maintenance. Uh, of the 16 components which are inside of it, the last one took only five days to put together. We also built a highly complex, you know, we're MIT, highly complex numerical model of the internal currents which are inside of the magnet because it has no internal insulators. So this magnet was also developed alongside our own fusion spin-out company, Commonwealth Fusions. And this is now the leading effort in commercializing fusion. And simultaneously with the technical innovation, we, we very much uh, innovated in organizational innovation. What did we do? We sped up tech transfer because the world needs this energy source very quickly. So we had the teams work together and those teams then were now part of the company are literally building the fabrication facilities today and they're being constructed in Devons, Massachusetts, just northwest of Boston. So they said it was so important to innovate both technically and organization-wise to speed up the, the pursuit of fusion. But let's see how this all works. So how does this translate then into a fusion device? So there'll be a video which goes along. So here are the 16 components which are separately made, stacked together, put inside of a strong structural case. These are the cooling plena, which provide the cooling from the outside. It was inserted into a large vacuum chamber called a cryostab. Then we circulate cool helium coolant in it, take it from room temperature to 20 degrees above absolute zero. And as we ramped up the current to 40,000 amps of current, it produced 20 Tesla that went through the magnetic field, and again, only consuming 25 watts of power at that time. Fully modulizing and be coming out. This is the shape of it. So we build a one of a very similar shape and we build 18 of the same ones. And then they get arranged into a so-called tokamak, which is a torus, which is basically a donut confi shaped configuration of those magnetic fields. And inside of that then, we place some other coils to control the plasma. Again, a vacuum cryostat, cap it up, cool it down to 20 degrees above absolute zero, but now, in this time, we actually make the magnetic field go in a circle around like this. This makes the blue part, which is the contained fuel of the hydrogen, uh, and that will exceed uh, about 200 million degrees Celsius by our predictions, and most importantly, actually produce fusion, net fusion energy for the first time. Yeah. So it's incredibly exciting. This is what the device looks like, and you can see the, you can see the people standing beside it. It actually almost would fit on, on, this, on this dais. And this, is, this was the revolution that the magnet gave us, is that this, by, by the science we understand of high field fusion, is that this is 40 times smaller than the ones that were needed before. And that was, that was the benefit of going to the much higher magnetic field. So it was designed by MIT and Commonwealth Fusion. And we think it changes not just fusion energy, the pursuit of fusion energy, but actually the world. It is under construction, as I said, just northwest of Boston right now. So what will it do? It will produce over 100 million watts of fusion power. And most importantly show that the plasma is now producing more controlled energy release than the energy that was required to actually keep the plasma fuel hot. And our present best estimate right now is that it would actually make 10 times more and energy. In other words, it's a tenfold power amplification. This is an incredibly exciting scientific threshold because it's never been exceeded, this, this, this ratio. And it means like we have a star on Earth. This is as a scientist, how can you not be excited about this? Um, but it's also the first view at the next and probably last form of energy ever harnessed by humanity. Because it's the power source of the universe. 
So beyond the Promethean <laughs> mythological aspects of this achievement, this is done fully in the context of accelerating practical fusion energy on the grid. Because everything we've done within this is now to inform our actual power plant that would be called ARC, which would follow on from this and be a commercial prototype to be put on through the grid and start producing carbon-free energy with, with fusion. So this actually completes a circle. Um, we saw the amazing work here in design, design activities. This started in, in, my, in my class, in a design class at MIT 2263, where I challenged our students to come up with a concept that would greatly accelerate fusion. They didn't let us down. So, uh, so what does this all mean, right? So you know, this last point about showing a green forest, it really com completes the circle and actually the theme of this, like our pursuit continues at MIT. This magnet and the launching of Commonwealth Fusion Systems is not the end of the innovations. It's the beginning of the innovations. Because what we have to deliver is an entire array of special technologies. Uh, and what does this mean? Materials, heat transfer, fusion fuels, maintenance, robotics, all of these things and these innovations will be required to accelerate the deployment of economic fusion energy. And that's our pursuit, as we welcome and train an entire new generation of fusion scientists. This fall, we have approximately 40 new graduate students coming to the Plasma Science and Fusion Center. Yeah. So we're, they're going to not just innovate in technology, but they're going to form the heart of the ecosystem of a fundamental new energy source, limitless and clean. So thank you for your support, and we look forward to working with you to literally making a better world. Thank you. Because of this vision, belief in the pressing goals of fusion, and most importantly, philanthropic support for this program, we are witnessing exactly how fusion energy will transform the planet. To think this is merely a small reflection of the groundbreaking work of MIT, work that has the power to positively impact communities, society, our planet, and all of humanity. And it's through the generosity of the MIT community, all of you here today, who have amplified our efforts, that this inspiring, world-changing work is possible. And there is still so much to do, because at MIT, we work on the future every day. That work is never done, because the pursuit of a better world is not a fixed point, but an ever-evolving quest. A better world will always be within our grasp, brought into being by the minds and hands of MIT working together. For what we have done, what we are doing, and what the future will bring, we cannot thank you enough. Your gift to MIT is, and will continue to be, a gift to the world. Thank you.